because because we didn't do any overdubs on the backing tracks, everything was uh, had to be kind of spot on. You know, if somebody made a mistake, then we'd stop and do it again, rather than the rest carry on and we just overdub that. Everything was done live, which was uh, which was a tribute to them. They're actually making music there and then on the spot, and it's not being processed endlessly and reworked and overdubbed. The middle section of Never Before, I think, was written by John. He went to a C. There's this big, long, elongated notes and more of a symphonic effect. Just a musical thought. They're nice chords to go together. Half-time, it's a different feel to what the rest of the verse was, which is kind of upbringing and rocky. And uh, this is really what faces Ian Gillan mostly, and sometimes Ian Gillan and myself. What do you sing there? You could sing any number of things. And it's kind of interesting to see what he did actually come up with. I was hurt when I was younger. Double tracking. By a woman who was cold. I'm sh sure this must have happened accidentally when it was first discovered, not by me. Body. So the double tracking sound became quite a thing. And I kept it for a long time and refined it. <laughs> That's very Beatlesy, isn't it? And uh, you know, double tracking, you can be very tight on double tracking. Um, but he's always been fond of kind of getting it a little bit loose because it gives it more character. And Richie's guitar answer is lovely in its simplicity, its bareness. Purple was really, to me, it was two elements. It was, it was the superb musicianship of Richie and John and Ian Pace, and the sort of naive, homemade, simple quality of songwriting that Ian Gillan and I brought to the band. The Mark II Deep Purple is what we think of as being Deep Purple, mostly because of the power of Machine Head. I still love doing Smoke on the Water. I still love doing Highway Star. I still love doing Space Trucking, and I still love doing Pictures of Home. Um, and all of those songs are, are rotated in and out of the show. Um, and they, I was gonna say mingle, but they actually mangle very well with all the other stuff we do. Machine Head was basically built on Ah, uh, you know, six or seven indestructible guitar riffs, uh, you know, pictures of home, uh, space trucking, and, you know, of course, smoke on the water. We all came out to Montreal. Maybe we learned our lesson after trying too hard with Fireball, uh, and maybe and partly because of the circumstances, but also because of we wanted to come up with something really good that we didn't try too hard. We made that record in three weeks and three days, and it was great, great substance, great record, and it was done, out. And to me, that um, represented how a record should be made, quick and to the point. And we had wonderful times, and we had stunning times. Uh, and we had downtimes too, but, but then that's the nature of, the, uh, of being in a rock band. You know, it's not all roses. Life was a ball. I was 21, 22 years old in a big rock and roll band in the early 70s. It was great. I mean, it was just a real good adventure. Everybody thoroughly enjoyed it. And uh, to have a great album come out of it was a bonus, really. I think the 
powerful thing about Machine Head was it came into the American consciousness right as that movement, that guitar riff, that mania for the guitar riff started picking up steam. We came over here on the back of uh, uh, Rod Stewart and the Faces tour, which we, we couldn't lose. We were in a second spot position. We, had, uh, we could pick the best songs just to hit an audience with like an hour of hard rock and roll. We couldn't lose. It was, it was just a, a glorious time and everything fell into place really quickly. The band was a very live band, full of very good musicians. Richie Blackmore playing at uh, <coughs> tremendous solos, the imaginative solos that uh, made Deep Purple special, uh, backed up by uh, Ian Pace's uh, brilliant drumming because uh, the thing about Purple was they meshed together, musically speaking, instrumentally speaking. They had this great rapport on stage. Smoke of the Water was just a track, and it wasn't really until um, we started touring. I think some DJ in America started playing it, and a whole bunch of DJs started playing it, and it, it was a groundswell, really. It, 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 it grew from public demand rather than from any kind of design on our part, um, which is, of course, the best way it could have been. Um, and it elevated what is really a sort of fairly simple track into you know, mythic status. It just goes to show that what's a hit record and what isn't really doesn't have anything to do with the, the content of, of a song. It's more about who's hearing it the most on the radio. That's why I'm very skeptical about what's a hit today and what isn't. And people, I think, mix up popularity with, um, with success. I think to be successful, you have to be a good musician. To be popular, you have to just be um, fashionable. Deep Purple's reputation was based on their performance as much as their studio recordings. They were hugely successful. I mean, album sales were enormous then, and uh, they were in huge demand for concert tours around the world. Their popularity, especially in America, was, was, was way up there. And, uh, they were headlining in the, in the big arenas, so they, they needed this album, and it, and it happened just at the right time for them. Everything came together at the same time. Uh, all these uh, talented young artists with tremendous uh, egos and talent to match. But there was this fear, this panic, that if we stopped, it would all be over. And so it was, we kept going and ground ourselves into the dust. Ian Gillen um, had given in, in his uh, resignation uh, about 18 months before he actually left. Gillen quits purple, I remember. What tensions there were in the band that had somehow sort of got buried under the the um, circumstances in which made the album kind of reappeared. The tensions had been there. I mean, they were there in Fireball. There was arguments and friction. And, uh, and after Machine Head, Richie became increasingly um, single-minded. There's an awful lot of things that happen. You, you go through this, your band is your family. And then you expand a little bit and all of a sudden, the band is not your only family. You know, there are other things in your life. And you need time to appreciate them and enjoy them. And that we didn't have that time. Quite honestly, if you look back, if someone said, okay, it's time for a six month break, all go away. You know, I think that would all worked wonders. The reason that Gillen wanted to leave at Mark II uh, was just the, the insane amount of work we, we were asked, being asked to do. The incessant touring became tough. Um, it all became a blur. With the benefit of hindsight, if I'd been the manager, you know, I would have, I, I think I could have kept that Mark together at least another three or four years, you know. There, there, there were solutions to any of the problems. The big crime to me was uh, that uh, the ballad wasn't put on it, you know, Blind Man. Yeah. The one song that's not on the album, but was recorded in that room, was uh, When a Blind Man Cries, which has gone on to have a complete life of its own. Um, and there's a lot of the lyrics of that actually sum up the making of Machine Head. As much as Smoke on the Water is the story of what happened, um, when a blind man cries, there's a lot of the atmosphere. And the idea of telling a story um, based on the principle that there's always someone worse off than you are, no matter how down you are, captured in the phrase of when a blind man cries, um, you know something's wrong, you know. 
Richie, he don't like it, uh, you know. My world is pale When a blind man cries 